Great. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Stacy, and uh, I'm a deep learning engineer here at Weights and Biases. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, some amazing visualization tools that we have for uh, self driving uh, tasks on Weights and Biases or autonomous navigation more generally. And as an outline, I'll, I'll dive into some specific uh, sub problems in, in self driving and the tools we have for those uh, semantic segmentation. 2D object detec detection and 3D object detection. Um, I'll then give an overview of some of the collaboration tools that are generally useful for anything you're working on uh, and do a deep dive on a report that I have on um, a particular semantic segmentation uh, problem and set of models and how I used weights and biases to help figure that out. Um, and I'd love your questions. I generally might keep this a little bit on the shorter side and then see what people want to dive into and also have interactive examples. Uh, so first, focusing on semantic segmentation. Um, this is a task where, uh, given an image, in this case, it'll be a, a dashboard scene from the dash of a, of a car. Uh, you need to label every pixel in the image as belonging to a particular class or category. Uh, my models have been training with 20 different um, of these categories or labels, so that's car or tree or building or road or human, uh, bicycle, et cetera. Um, and different, different models have different labels, uh, but those are sort of the main ones that we care about. You can also imagine doing this on videos. And I have some links here if you want to check out some code examples. There's a cool Kaggle competition for this from CVPR 2018. Uh, you can also extend this to segmenting drivable area. So knowing which lane is available for a car to switch into. And this um, is encapsulated in a great uh, data set, Berkeley Deep Drive 100K. I've been using this a lot. It has um, lots of self-driving uh, car-related tasks and data sets. Um, and the solution that we provide for this at Weights and Biases is semantic segmentation masks, which let you easily and interactively compare model predictions to ground truth. Let's see if this works. I'm going to jump into a report that I made for this. And you can uh, check this out and try it yourself in a collab notebook here. Um, but just to give you an overview, this lets you um, separately log the examples that you're using the raw photos for your model, and then the uh, class annotations for them. So in this case, uh, you can see that this human is um, not tagged here, but here we can see uh, them outlined in uh, orange. You'll also see that this uh, should be road, but it's classified as sidewalk. And I think this is because it's overfitting on lots of examples where humans are generally on or next to the sidewalk. And um, one, or the most amazing aspect of uh, this feature is that you don't need to log fixed uh, layers in advance. You can interact interactively decide which classes you care about and how to overlay them over your um, training images. So uh, here you can see more of these examples interactively. And from the controls here, you can turn on and off any of the classes. Um, these are ground truth and prediction masks overlaid with the initial results and the final results. So you can see, say, the prediction of the human uh, converging much more on the uh, ground truth label. Another way you can um, lay this out is just looking at the final predictions for, uh, for each model. And uh, let's jump into the results for a particular one. Um, here, all three, um, so the, the raw photo, the model's prediction, and the ground truth, all three of those masks are overlaid on top of each other, uh, which looks pretty cool, but might be a little hard to read. Like here, we see that the ground truth annotation gets the bus, but it looks like we've labeled it in a different color. Uh, so one thing we can do is split these up so that we get all three masks separately. And now we can see that the correct labeling is bus, but it looks like this example actually has it labeled as a truck, which we can confirm by toggling the truck on and off. And then we can sort of scroll through these and see how it's generally doing. Uh, here's another example where you know, the truck is actually labeled um, as a car. And that's understandable. That's a pretty uh, uh, easy confusion to make. Plus, you can see the details like the traffic uh, poles that it's actually doing pretty well on here. 
um, but maybe not getting some of the detail, especially in faraway cars. Um, and so I, I'm just showing a bunch of different examples here. Uh, let's hop into a different feature. Um, 2D object detection, which is another class of problem in uh, self-driving. What we want to do is uh, draw a box, a bounding box around an object that we care about, say a car uh, or a human, or again, a traffic sign. And you can do this in 3D as well. There's a great uh, lift uh, data set for this on Kaggle. And uh, what we do for this in weights and biases is enable you to uh, see bounding boxes with an interactive slider for confidence level. And let me again hop into a report where I am again training on the Berkeley Deep Drive. This is uh, this time it's not semantic segmentation, it's a YOLO v3 network for object detection. And here you can just at a glance see a bunch of the bounding boxes and you can um, zoom into it a little bit like this. And I can set the score slider, you know, maybe it's too noisy. I'm going to set it higher. Uh, and you can see that a lot of the low confidence ones disappear. You can toggle them on and off. You'll notice this bus, for example, um, blinking in and out. What else does this model detect? Benches, fire hydrants, airplanes. I don't think there's any airplanes in the validation data set. Um, and you can, of course, show this zoomed in and use this to debug the details of your model. You know, this is, this is doing really well here on people, even getting this one in the background. Um, but it does, for example, miss this tiny fire hydrant here. You can see that there's some overlap between trucks and cars, and you can read the confidence score here. Um, and, you know, if you, if you check out these reports, you can see that the, the syntax for logging this is really easy, and we, take bounding boxes as both uh, relative and absolute coordinates, um, and it's all nicely done for you. And uh, hopping back into a different feature, 3D object detection. Um, and here we're looking at point clouds generated from LiDAR. Um, this is again from the LIFT data set. It's um, really cool to play with this, uh, with this data. And what we let you do in weights and biases is actually log and interact with the point cloud and we'll see if this works in present mode. Um, but basically, I can expand one of these. Oh, oh. Um, this might be a little much, but you can, um, I think that's going to be too much for the browser. But basically, you can just trust me that you can pan and zoom and rotate around the map and see how the bounding boxes uh, here, the ground truth is in green and the predictions are in yellow. Sometimes they overlap. Um, Sometimes the model doesn't quite get the correct orientation for the car or thinks a tree is a person, etc. Um, so this is another fun logging tool. And then uh, hopping back, right, this is um, a link to the report. And um, maybe you can see here a more detailed example. You know, when the boxes are lined up, that means our model uh, got a pretty good prediction of the ground truth but then there's cases in both directions, lots of predictions that are actually picking up on some noise. Although this here could be a car that we've detected that was unlabeled in the original data set. Um, and now zooming out to collaboration tools, um, the, um, the sweeps, workspace, and reports functionality are really useful for self-driving problems I found, but they're also useful generally. I think from here, I'll just hop into a report of mine uh, that focuses on semantic segmentation. And we'll wait for it to load. And um, reports are specifically very useful to uh, write down intermediate results and share them with colleagues or other folks um, who might be interested in your work. Here, I first describe uh, the task, which is taking these raw photos and then generating these predictions. And I can compare them to the ground truth. You'll notice that this is the old style. I'm not using the fancy interactive image masks because those didn't exist when I made this report. Um, and you can see the model's doing pretty well. For example, it's getting these humans. Uh, but you can see here that this um, bicycle rider is not identified as a bike and a rider. It's just a human, right? And um, 
some of the details of these uh, traffic posts are, are, aren't, aren't detected correctly. And you'll see there's some haziness here. And that's probably, be, probably because the light quality is, is pretty weak in this original photo. Um, yeah, so you, you can see it's a little bit trickier to compare across these than having the overlaid masks. Um, maybe someday I'll, I'll upgrade this report. Uh, and here I talk a little bit through uh, the task. I'm using code um, made by my colleague, Boris, uh, that's a unit in FastAI. And I'm using different encoders to see basically how well I can identify different classes. And in the process of working on this, um, I noticed that uh, although I was getting a high average accuracy, um, it was doing really well on cars and traffic signs, but really poorly on humans when I split it up into per class accuracy. So here, for example, you can see that all of the car accuracies for three different models in these solid lines are, um, you know, in the, in the low 90s, even as high as 95, which is pretty good. Um, the dashed lines are traffic, and that's like the most detailed and the hardest to get. So they're relatively lower across models. And then the dots is the overall accuracy, and that's, you know, coming in at around the high 80s across models which is pretty good, but if you look at uh, human accuracy, it's, it's incredibly low. And partially this is because uh, human pixels don't take up that much space in the data, you know, compared to the number of pixels that are occupied by cars or roads, humans are just a very tiny fraction of that. So it also doesn't get to see that many examples. Um, so one thing that I found a change that was really helpful was to look at intersection over union instead um, as the metric. And uh, intersection over union is sort of like a Venn diagram. So instead of looking at the percentage of pixels that are correct, you look at the overlap uh, between the predictions and the ground truth for a given class. Um, and this helped me train models that were much more accurate overall. The one interesting detail that I found when I varied um, encoders for my unit is that um, the best performing uh, model or encoder type for a human IOU was AlexNet, um, but overall it was less good than ResNet because it would predict these, um, this is a representative example here, these blocky humans and get a lot, of, a lot of intersection, right? But not actually capture any of the details and definitely not capture, you know, um, this tiny, tiny human in the background here. Maybe it's even a pair. Um, and you know, this just shows some of the awesome report features to just do a diff of two of my model configs. Um, some more examples from AlexNet. Another mode that it would get into is just pick up on the very, very fine details of the photo instead of the, the broad um, categories. Um, there's more examples here. And I'll scroll through to the part where I run a sweep um, and a sweep is a, a nice UI for hyperparameter search and weights and biases where you can just specify some of the hyperparameters you want to explore, like learning decay, or sorry, <laughs> learning rate, weight decay, training stages, and then uh, launch agents that will basically try your same training script, but with different hyperparameter values. And then you'll get nice visualizations of that training over time and this parallel coordinates plot. And uh, every experiment that I ran is a line here that's connecting values on these vertical um, number lines. And you can see that the high accuracies are in, are in yellow and the lower ones are in purple. And these um, are just failed experiments. Um, and you can see that there's not a clear relationship with weight decay. It's sort of all over the place. We don't have a strong uh, signal. For training stages, it looks like the lower ones are better, but also I try and, tried a lot more experiments with lower values. And then for learning rate, it seems like the lower, you know, lower learning rate generally correlates with higher accuracy. And it's nice because you can click into any one of these experiments. Um, I then, um, the last awesome bit about sweeps is that we run a random forest for you in the background on your hyperparameters and your target metric. So here for human IOU, if that's the one I care about, it turns out that the AlexNet encoder is the highest um, predictor of, of good human IOU, and it's very highly correlated here, while decreasing the learning rate, as we just saw from the sweep, uh, is the next most important thing. And of course, we want to increase the number of training examples, et cetera. And weight decay, as you can see, doesn't, doesn't really matter that much. Um, what's cool is I can switch this and pick a different target metric like average IOU across all of my classes, not just humans. 
Um, and here we'll see that the learning rate matters a lot. Um, you know, the number of examples matters a lot. Uh, and then actually ResNet is more useful because it's, it's a much more advanced model and more precise overall. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that particular um, report. And these are just some, some screenshots of what I showed. I, um, there's a really cool visual in sweeps that I want to briefly show, which plots every experiment over time um, as it comes in. These are just some metrics for some of my experiments, so training loss, car accuracy, and it's awesome that you can customize these in a dashboard. Um, here it is. So these are all the experiments I ran, all the uh, different combinations of hyperparameters, and you can see the IOU, which is my target metric, improving over time. And the best run is, is, is this one. And I can um, find that configuration of hyperparameters and use it in my future experiments. Um, so all of this is ongoing work, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hopefully it's a reasonable overview of the kinds of things you can do with um, what, with some biases tools for self-driving, though of course I have a whole appendix of other fun sub-problems in self-driving that can go on for much longer. Well, yeah, um, I'm always impressed by just the like breadth of uh, problems that you've tackled uh, using using the using the tool. It's uh, yeah. As somebody who has done a lot of more theoretical machine learning work in which, you know, it's MNIST and CFAR most of the time, it's, it's wild <laughs> to see, you know, just how much else there is out there. Um, so what would you say is the biggest insight that you gained from, uh, from using the sweeps tool on your self-driving um, on your self-driving problems, or I guess, or even more broadly, like, can you think of like one specific instance of really strong insight driven by in, in any of the examples that you showed that you want to highlight? Uh, yeah, definitely. That's a great question. So um, initially I was running these sweeps to maximize accuracy. Um, and I was then logging separately my metrics for accuracy on different classes. And I was noticing that, you know, I was trying a bunch of stuff, but basically there was no signal for human accuracy. And when I switched to uh, IOUs, um, I actually set my search space wide enough that some of the sweeps uh, generated um, signal for human IOU. And these were combinations of um, sampling and settings that um, would actually give you know, some, some signal on this. Uh, and that was really cool to see. Although a lot of them have AlexNet uh, as the encoder, so then there's a question of um, you know, focusing in on the search space, seeing what the best ResNet ones are. Um, but it's really awesome to be able to let the sweep run and then discover a direction to follow based on what that sweep finds instead of manually trying it myself. Mm, I see. Yeah, but in a very sort of iterative way, like you try something, there's a whole bunch of things. Maybe you know, a lot of your runs fail, you know, uh, some more than <laughs> others, but then that tells you the, the where to go next, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can even configure, I call this iterative sweeps. You know, you, you have some findings from a stage of experiments and then you set a new search space or go deeper in one direction. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so folks in the, in the Zoom or on the uh, YouTube, uh, if you have questions, go ahead and submit them. And, uh, but while you're doing that, I'm gonna take a look at the responses to our survey and we'll come back to them. Uh, I'll come back to Stacy with any questions that pop up. So uh, it looks like we got an exactly equal number of answers for the two possibilities. So the reveal step here is maybe a little bit less exciting than it could be. But let's see what people said. Uh, all right. Uh, it, it was an option actually to pick both yes and no if you wanted. Uh, so uh, that maybe, you know, it's a, it does not compute sort of divide by zero kind of answer. but uh, yeah, it looks like people picked, people are, are about equally, about an equal number of people think it's definitely going to happen and it's definitely not going to happen uh, by 2025. I'd be interested to know, maybe people can drop this in the in the chat somewhere, whether people think that maybe my date was too aggressive that, uh, or uh, that maybe it's 2030 or 2035, uh, or if people think that that's totally impossible. So if you have thoughts about that, drop that in the chat. Um, we do have a question in the Q&A for Stacey. Uh, so aside from AlexNet, 
which CNN backbone did you find that provides the best results for your image segmentation tasks? And do you think that there's sort of like a single answer to that for all kinds of tasks? Um, I, I think it's hard to uh, say that it'll be for all kinds of tasks. The ones that I tried here were AlexNet, ResNet 34, and um, a smaller number for ResNet 18, I believe. Um, and, um, you know, ResNet 34 does the best across classes, and AlexNet has this edge on humans because it actually predicts these large blocky regions. Um, one interesting thing is with semantic segmentation, uh, my batch size needs to be a lot smaller than the kinds of CNN problems that I'm used to because there's just so much signal of prediction for each pixel. Um, and, you know, more complicated encoders would just require a little bit more optimization in order to, to train at a reasonable speed on my GPUs. Um, interesting. Uh, yeah, it seems, uh, seems plausible to me that, yeah, that there's not necessarily one right answer. Uh, it's probably a good idea to try out multiple, uh, multiple models from the model zoo, um, but, you know, for every task, every time you come up with something new. Definitely, and I tried, you know, a bunch of the default available ones in fast AI, and you could, you know, customize from there for sure. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. So, but the, but the, the thing about AlexNet pred predicting relatively blocky regions, that's an architectural constraint of AlexNet, right? Due to the, like, um, just due to the, the, like, numbers on the convolutions in the pools? Um, it's, I think we could get into, you know, more finer architectural <laughs> uh, distinctions, but I think overall, you know, it, it does less well as an older and much simpler architecture, or at least that's the way that I understand it. So when we're looking at these giant images and these fine details, um, it's not generalizing as well. I see. Yeah. Uh, just curious if that, if that AlexNet finding viewers would, would be just like a general property that would be sometimes good, sometimes bad, depending on your task. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's possible to fine tune this particular AlexNet version for this encoder in, in a better way. You know, I'm just taking mm. the pre-trained version, so. Gotcha.